Thank you so much for inviting me into your mists, this English heretic, and uh, for coming out to see what I have to say. I'm going to talk for about three quarters of an hour, 50 minutes, something like that. And then I thought it would be nice if we had a break so that you can use the, what you Americans call the restroom, just in case you need a rest. Uh, and get some water and, and have a stretch. And then we can come back together. And if you've got any questions um, about what I've had to say, I'll be more than happy to do my best to address them. Philosophy has got itself a bad press, I feel. It's seen as abstract, often, or irrelevant, kind of ivory tower stuff. But you know, the truth is the complete opposite. For me, philosophy is like extreme sports for the mind. It's a rush. It's exciting. What could be more of a thrill than coming across ideas which so profoundly change how you experience life that you find yourself living in a new reality. What could be more fun than that? So I'm, I feel I'm on a bit of a mission to try and make philosophy fun and fashionable. And when I hear people say it's impractical, it makes me laugh because you know everything you've done today, everything you've done every day, is predicated on who you think you are and what you think life is. Now if you've got that wrong, Hmm. See, that seems practical. That seems worth investigating now and again, at least. And the philosophy which interests me is so old and so universal. It's found in every time, in every culture. It's so old, it's called often the perennial philosophy. In fact, it's so old that the ancient Greeks called it the perennial philosophy. That's how old it is. And what fascinates me about this universal philosophy, which I call Gnosticism, is that it, it's not just about some beautiful ideas, although they are beautiful ideas. It's, a, it's about pointing to an experience, something which you can know. It's about what in the West was called gnosis, which means knowing. In the East, it's called enlightenment. And everywhere, whether you're talking about the Taoists in China, or the original Christians, or whoever, talk about it as waking up. And I want to explore with you tonight what that waking up is, and to share with you why I think it's really, really important. And why I think it's a universal human experience available to everyone, anyone, available to you and me. But before I do that, I want to talk about its opposite. Because, you know, I have written lots of books, 20-something books, and I'm, I've written, I should think now, on every major spiritual tradition in the world. And what fascinates me is that each of these traditions have two poles, if you like, and they're kind of opposites. On the one hand, often the people who start these movements, and certainly at the heart of them, you find these Gnostics or mystics. And what I love about these guys is they're all saying the same thing. They use a different language. I mean, they literally speak in different languages, of course, because they're coming in from different cultures. And they use different concepts. But their message is like different fingers pointing at the same reality. In the Zen tradition, they talk about different fingers pointing at the moon. It's about pointing at this, this experience, which is an experience of waking up to oneness and to love. It's about what unites us. But what I say, see on the other hand is that these 
What often starts as this vibrant Gnostic exploration of reality degenerates over time into dogmatic religion, which is really not, it, it, it's the opposite. And what I see here is a lot of people looking at the finger and completely ignoring the moon. And I see people getting, arguing endlessly about whose finger is the true finger. And being able to quote chapter and verse about the nature of the finger. But with no knowledge at all about where it's pointing. Quite literally, this dogmatic religion completely misses the point. And what that does is it means that people here caught up here, all disagree with each other. Here, these people tend to be eclectics, they tend to pull on wisdom where they can find it, they look for the commonality, but here, not only do people disagree, but they disagree with the backing of God. And that spells trouble. Because once God is involved in backing up opinions, you have that absolute authority to do whatever it is you think you should do. And what I see throughout history is that this religious uh, fundamentalism in its extreme form has been a constant source of immense suffering and division. It creates an us and them world where quite literally God likes some people but not others. In fact, he likes some people so much he's going to put them in paradise forever. And he, and he dislikes some people so much he's going to torture them forever. It's a very extreme us and them universe created by this dogmatic religion. Quite the opposite of the oneness and love being talked about by these Gnostics. Now what Peter and I, Peter Gandhi, my co-author and friend, and I do in our, our new book, The Laughing Jesus, is look at both of these. Its subtitle is Religious Lies and Gnostic Wisdom. And the first half of the book is called The Bathwater, and the second half is called The Baby. Because I feel very strongly that we need to address this religious fundamentalism, this literalism, and see it for what it is before we can really wake up to this incredible perennial knowledge which it often covers over. This is what we need to get rid of. This is what we need to keep. That's what I'm exploring with you. Throughout history, you know, we have a, it's not, it's not meant to be taken literally, it's kind of playful, it's kind of provocative, but there's a line in the new book which goes, religion is the devil's greatest achievement. <laughs> now, I'm not saying that there's a guy up there with, you know, horns and a pointy tail uh, orchestrating all of this, but if the devil, the diablos, is what divides us, nothing throughout history has divided us so absolutely as religion, and it still does. Why is that? Why have we seen this bloody history? I mean, let's remember the, uh, the, the Crusades where, we, where, where children were boiled alive. Let's remember that it was the Catholic Church in the 13th century that first hounded Jews into ghettos, made them wear the Star of David, persecuted them relentlessly. It, it, it was the Catholic Church that first took heretics and basted them with oil and then put them in ovens. You know, all that changed with, with the Nazis was that the process was industrialized. All of this had been going on for centuries. You know, the, the Spanish Inquisition, you know, all those little instruments they made just to really create the maximum amount of pain in the people that they were interrogating? They planned, they had detailed plans to liquidate the whole of the population of Holland. That's incredible, isn't it? because they went Protestant. They didn't manage to do that, but they did have a damn good go in South America. And I could go on and on, the three million women burned as witches. I mean, it's just endless. Why is that? And why is it still with us today, causing so much division and suffering? You know, it is hard to understand. It's kind of easier when you look at another culture, I think, to see that what we're dealing with here is a kind of madness. It's something you know, which is why it causes such 
chaos. You know, we've, when I, just when I left from England, bombs went off in London. Since I've been here, more bombs have gone off in London. And the young men who were responsible for that, it's hard to understand their motivation. It's hard for me to put myself in their shoes. Because that requires me to, under, to really understand that they are doing this as a surrender to God. You see, what unites all these people is they're all doing it for God. So these young men really believe that when they fire off that bomb, that when the inferno hits, whereas all the infidels will be burning in hell forever, they will be rewarded for their surrender to God, to Allah. And they will be rewarded by eternity in paradise. Where, according to the Quran, they will have 72 virgins for eternity. See, if it wasn't so dark, you kind of, it's funny, right? But it doesn't quite work, does it? I mean, what, do they stay virgins? <laughs> I mean, doesn't that defeat the object? <laughs> I was talking in Kansas, and a, a lady came up to me afterwards, and she said, uh, she said, you tell those young Muslim boys they don't want 72 virgins. They want 72 well-experienced women. <laughs> it is funny. It's also not funny, of course. But it is funny because it's, it, you see it from a different culture, and it's absurd. But it's harder to see our own blind spots in the culture we've grown up in ourselves. And yet it's the same for us. It's the same for our Judaic Christian culture. We have pulled into ideas that if we can just stand back from them, are crazy. What Peter and I suggest is that all of this religious dogmatism, all of it comes down to one particularly bad idea. And that's this, that God writes books. Or, or at least he, you know, he, he, he gets a secretary to write them for him, a Moses or a Muhammad or somebody. But that's essentially it. The, the idea which underlies this literalism, which cr is creating such suffering, has done and continues to do so, is that some books aren't just books. They're special books. They're holy books. Their sacred scripture, and they contain the infallible, absolute opinions of God. Now, once you've got that idea, you're in trouble, because you get stuck in this reasoning which goes, everything in this book is true. How do I know? It says so in this book. <laughs> and round and round you go. And it's very hard to break out. So what Peter and I do in the first half of our book, The Laughing Jesus, The Bathwater, is to show, I think, categorically, with the backing of the cutting all of the evidence from the cutting edge of modern scholarship and archaeology and historical research, that these books are just books. And like all books, they have good bits and they have bad bits. They have bits which are, are as wise today as they were many hundreds of years ago. All, I mean, the, the, the Old Testament, the Jewish Tanakh, the New Testament, and the Quran, you'll find sentiments such as, love your enemies. Now, I don't know anything, our book is dedicated to those who love their enemies. I don't know anything more profound than that. But you will also find a lot of very ugly, grotesque calls to violence as well. And until we can see them as just books and discriminate those two, we will be forever stuck in this cycle of religious violence. So what we do is we take the Old Testament, the New Testament, and Quran, and just look at them. And what I want to do now, very, very quickly, because I really want to get onto this philosophy stuff, because that's my real love, is I want to share with you some outrageous thoughts. Uh, I'm not inviting you uh, to uh, believe me, because uh, belief is, just believing people is what's got us in this problem.
in the first place. What, I'm in, what I would do, though, is say, if you find it intriguing, check out the evidence for yourself. Actually have a look at it and see whether what I'm saying is just uh, nonsense or whether actually there is substantial evidence to back up. The, well, cause, cause it, for some people, what I'm about to say may be, may be outrageous. On the back of the book, which got us in trouble with the publishers because they were a bit worried we were going to get a fatwa put out on us, it says, what if the Old Testament is a work of fiction, Jesus never existed, and Muhammad was a mobster? And what I want to suggest to you is all three of those are true. Let's start very quickly with the Old Testament. I want to suggest that all of the historical evidence we now have points overwhelmingly to the fact that the Old Testament is not the history of the Jews, let alone the history of humanity, going back to Adam and Eve and the creation, but is a set of legends created much, much later, probably in the second century BCE. It is no more historical than the Iliad or the Odyssey or any of the other collections of legends that we have from other cultures that we're all too happy to just see for what they are because we haven't been brought up to believe that there's something special. There is absolutely no historical evidence for the existence of any of the A-list celebrities of the Bible. Obviously, um, you know, we could, I think hopefully the, you know, no one's expecting evidence for Adam and Eve or Noah and his flood and all that sort of thing. You know, that's clearly mythology. But when we get to Abraham, there's a tendency to think we're now into history, and we're not. Abraham, Moses, the exodus from Egypt, the, the Jews in Egypt in the first place, no evidence at all. David, Solomon, Joshua, all these characters, no evidence whatsoever at all. And let me just pick out one example to give you the sort of thing I mean. King David, or Solomon, mighty monarchs who ruled over a vast empire, palaces, temples, libraries, wealth, hundreds of wives and concubines, a vast navy. When you have a culture like that, it leaves something behind. If you go across to Egypt, where they did have a culture like that, you can't miss it. It's everywhere. If you go to Mesopotamia, where they also had a culture like that, and you dig in the ground, it is full of remains, foundations, and artifacts. Over the last few decades, archaeologists, particularly Israeli archaeologists, have been digging all over Israel and Palestine. And what have they found? Mud huts. No palaces from the time of David and Solomon. No artifacts, no jewelry, no written material, no tablets. Mud huts and little bits of broken pottery. If there was a David, and there's really absolutely no reason to believe there was, he was a hilltop chieftain who ruled pastoralists and shepherds. And those aren't my words, by the way. That's the words of Israel Finkelstein, who's the professor of archaeology at Tel Aviv University. If we can start seeing that the whole historical basis that we've taken for granted just doesn't hold up to the evidence of modern scrutiny, then we can address an even bigger blind spot. And that is that there's also absolutely no historical evidence for the existence of Jesus. And you know, if you can stand back from the, the conditioning that we've had so young and just look at it for what it is, it's obviously mythology. I mean, if I came in here tonight and said, hi, I want to talk to you about my friend Peter, who was born of a virgin, who changed water into wine at my wedding, and walks on water, and he died last week and came back from the dead, 
I would hope that most people here would go, yeah, <laughs> I'm going to need a bit more than that to be convinced that that's true because I've never met anyone born of a virgin or, do, or come back from the dead or any of those things. And yet, for some reason, based on a dodgy old book, 2,000 years old, which we rarely actually investigate its authenticity, who wrote it, why, where it came from, huge numbers of us are ready just to believe that. The thing about the Jesus myth is it's not only a myth, it's actually a pagan myth. For hundreds of years before the time when Jesus is meant to have lived, pagans in their so-called mystery religions had told a story which is, contains all the elements we later find in the Joshua or Jesus story. They tell a story of a pagan son of God who's born of a virgin in a cave or a stable before three shepherds, who has 12 disciples, who initiates the rites of baptism, who changes water into wine at a wedding, who performs miracles, who introduces a new religion, who is persecuted and put to death, sometimes by crucifixion, and who raises after three days, and who you commune with by taking bread and wine symbolizing his body and blood. All of that was throughout the ancient world going right back to Osiris in ancient Egypt. This ancient god-man was known by different names in different cultures, so that in, in uh, Egypt he's Osiris, in Greece he's Dionysus, in Persia he's Mithras, he's also Serapis, Adonis, Attis, and he's also Joshua, or Jesus. And if you go to the early texts of Christian writers, you will not find one single writer who disputes this. Because the pagan commentators are, are saying to them, look, this is our story. And their response is, well, it depends who we're talking about. If we're talking about the Gnostics amongst the Christians, their response is, yes, that's right. They call Jesus, in their texts, many-faced Attis. He is Attis. He's just their version of this dying and resurrecting God-man. And their great heresy, for which they're later eradicated brutally by the Holy Roman Empire, is that Jesus never came in the flesh. He's not a man. Rather, he's something better than that. He is the hero of initiation myth, which is so old it truly is the, the greatest story ever told goes right back to the dawning of writing and, and Egypt. <clears throat> and it's a story about each one of us. He represents each one of us on our journey to Gnosis, or waking up. The word for resurrection also means waking up. It's a journey to experiencing this Gnosis, and it's a very old story. But these literalists over here, which we don't get any of these guys until the end of the second century, they've got a different idea. For them, the Jesus story is history. That, as I said, is a very late development. And they claim the explanation. They don't dispute that it's the same story. They say that the devil came in advance and made up all these pagan stories so that when Jesus came and actually lived it out, everyone would get confused. It's kind of plagiarism by anticipation. If you like. <laughs> That's a huge topic, and I'm happy to come back to it in the questions, but I'm just going to leave it there for now. And finally, let's look at Muhammad. When we get to Muhammad, here we have an historical man. But when you get to know him, you kind of wish he wasn't. Because Muhammad is a mystic who becomes a mobster. He is channeling God, claiming to. He is saying, listen, this, this, I'm having messages from God. And the messages from God have an uncanny ability to endorse the power of Muhammad. So that he start, God says that the Arabs are the chosen people. They're his favorite people. It's funny how God has favorite people always, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> You're my favorite. <laughs> what sort of father is this? <clears throat> the Arabs are his favorite people, 
And amongst the Arabs, the Quraysh family, which just happens to be Muhammad's family, is the favorite family. And amongst the Quraysh, Muhammad is the favorite person. And it starts off about doing what God says, and it ends up doing what Muhammad says. And what Muhammad does is he sets up in what is, in effect, a protection racket. In Arabia at that time, it's just made up of lots of little tribes, all, and they all exist by pirating each other. It's the way that most tribes did. And Muhammad comes along, he's a charismatic, powerful leader. He institutes this new religion, which unites people. And the basic deal is, you join my ummah, my community, and we won't pirate you. But we will have a big army to go and pirate everyone else. And that's what they do. Over a period of 20 years, Muhammad leads the equivalent of one attack every 12 weeks for 20 years. At the end of which, he has an empire which will actually turn into amazing civilization. Is that bad? Is that good? It's what all cultures have been through. But it's certainly not the basis to be living our life now. And if we do, well, we, we know what happens if, 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 if we do. We're witnessing that now. We're witnessing in the, in the Muslim world people stuck in the time of Muhammad, which is why you see these grotesque images of people having their head cut, up, cut off. Whilst the people doing it have Kalashnikov rifles over their shoulder. So why are they using knives? Well, because that's the way Muhammad did it. That's why they have the beards, because that's the way Muhammad did it. Everything is stuck. And the danger for all cultures, once you, once you say a book is there is the absolute wisdom for all time, is you become stuck in it. And when you see that the history of these books is so checkered that all of them have been created by the sort of people you wouldn't want to hang out with. <laughs> the Old Testament was put together in the second century BCE by Taliban-esque fundamentalist Jews who needed scripture, needed, all, needed of divine authority to justify their expansionist agenda. There was a sh they, the Jews had been uh, ruled by foreign powers pretty much all the time. The Assyrians, the Babylonians, the Greeks, and then a short window where they burst out and tried to become a power in their own right before the Romans moved in and put an end to it. And in that time, they created what we now call the Old Testament. And the reason that it has passages like uh, God telling Joshua that he you know, gives them the land of Cana and that they should go in and take it and kill every breathing thing or, God t uh, or Moses telling his war party when they come back from fighting the Midianites and say they haven't killed everyone, to go back and kill everyone, except the women and children. And sorry, no, no, not the women. Can kill everyone, including the women and children, except the young girls. They, they, they can keep the young girls. Why is that in there? It's in there because that's what this, these Hasmoneans, these f Jewish fundamentalists, were doing at the time. And this gave them the justification. This was our land. It was given us to us by God. We once ruled over it in a mighty empire under David and Solomon. God likes genocide. Look, it says so in the holy text. Let's go get them. And that's what they did. The New Testament is a completely different thing. It is a Gnostic myth. It's about waking up. It is very profound and very beautiful. But the versions that we have and the book that we have was put together and, in, and hoisted on us by the Roman Empire. You know, he, it's a book created. The Bible is a book created by a fascist empire. It's like God. I mean, just to see that, you know, the, you can't. You know, it's indisputably true. That's who created the Bible. That's who put it together in the way we have it. Now, you know, if you want straight roads, underfloor heating, and viaducts. The Romans. You can't get any better than the Romans. But if you want spiritual wisdom, do you go to a fascist empire? I don't think so. And that book, 
was used in the fourth centuries when it was uh, really when the empire took off with Christianity to justify once again Taliban esque black clad monks who rampaged around the ancient world, pulling down libraries, pulling down temples. They closed down Eleusis, which had been a center of initiation for a thousand years. They killed Gnostics. They killed Jews. They killed pagans, they killed anyone who did not agree. And we moved within a few decades from a situation where we knew that the world was a sphere, that it went round the sun, and we even knew its circumference to within 1% of accuracy. But under the influence of that fundamentalism, we went back to a state where you could be killed if you said the world was not flat. And we entered a thousand years that we call the Dark Ages. That's what it gave us, the Dark Ages. And the Quran is a book put together to, to justify fundamentally the rule of the Quraysh family amongst the Arabs. Because in, in the, the Quran, you know, Moses starts as a prophet. He becomes the prophet, and finally he's the prophet for all time. That's it, finished, the doors are closed, no one's going to say anything later, this is it. And now, you know, he started as a man, and by the end he became the super being who is right now sitting on God's right hand, waiting to judge all you guys when you die. Except, of course, Christians know that can't be true, because Jesus is sitting on God's right hand, waiting to judge all you guys when you die. Personally, I kind of feel it's because all these prophets are sitting on his hands that God is not doing more about the state of the world. That's what we explore in the bathwater. That's what I feel we need to see for what it is. We need to wake up from this, this, this blindness, this unconsciousness, and just look at it. And go, look, this is kind of obvious what it is. Actually, it's a book with a history, with some great bits in, and with some bad bits in. And if we can do that, we can just leave that. We don't have to be stuck in it anymore. And maybe instead, we can listen to these heretical voices of these Gnostics, who throughout all of the ages have been saying something quite different to any of that. And what I want to do with the time I've got left before we have the break is just explore what this Gnostic vision of waking up is. Because I feel that I, you know, it's, what our agenda is not a negative agenda. It's not about taking something away, or not just. It's about going, there is something underneath this which is truly, truly beautiful. What I hear from the Gnostics is this. And you know, it can at first seem even madder than all this stuff that I've been gently poking fun at. What I hear is, life is not what it seems. You are not who you think you are. Because life is like a dream. And you are really the dreamer. Now, I have another little book, which is really my pride and joy, which has come out at the same time. Some of you may have seen it at the back. Called Lucid Living. A book you can read in an hour that will turn your world inside out. <laughs> the reason it's called... What I've done in that book is I've tried to condense down this Gnostic wisdom of waking up to make it as simple and as accessible to show that it's not certainly not religious. In fact, really, it's not even spiritual. It's just about life as we live it now. And to take you through a journey of seven key ideas which can, I hope, help you taste this waking up for yourself. I haven't got the time to go through all of that right now, but what I'd like to do is give you a little taste of what I think this is. And the reason that I call the book Lucid Living is because I think the way into this gnosis, this waking up, is through drawing a comparison with lucid dreaming. Now, when you dream at night, normally we're lost in the dream. Yeah, 
It's like you're, you're em embroiled unconsciously in the story, it's the drama of your dream. You think you're the person you appear to be in your dream. You're, sometimes it's so real, it's terrifying. But when you dream lucidly, you're conscious that you're dreaming. It puts you in a very interesting predicament. Because on the one hand, you appear to be a person in the dream, but, but on the other hand, you recognize that what you really are is the dreamer, is the awareness within which the dream is arising. You have two natures, what you appear to be and what you are in a dream. This gnosis, this waking up, is the same right now. That's why I call it lucid living. It is rec recognizing that right now, you also have two natures. On the one hand, there's what you appear to be. This. An object, a thing, a person, a body. But is that who you really are? Is that who you really are? The way to start inquiring into this, I think, is to first notice something absolutely obvious that most of us ignore. And that's this. Look, most of the time I see us running around as if we're absolutely convinced we know who we are, what life is, da -da -da, what needs to be done, just like we do in a dream. And we completely ignore something so obvious and startling which is simply this. Life is a mystery. Life is the mother of all mysteries. It is the most extraordinary mystery. This moment right now is extraordinarily strange. Not just what it is, but that it is. That you exist. That you exist. And, and what I see is that sooner or later we're going in, around in our lives as if we know it all, got the whole thing sewn up, and then something happens. I, I work with people who are dying in, in the past quite a bit, and I saw it a lot around death and bereavement. Suddenly, bang, you get ill or somebody dies, and then boom, all of that certainty just collapses around you and you find yourself face to face with this awesome, breathtaking mystery of existence that you are. If you, if you have had that thing when you wake up in the middle of the night on your own, it's really quiet and you just know you exist and it's so, so mysterious and suddenly you don't know who you are, and you don't know what life is, and you just see how mysterious this is, actually, all of the time. I mean, now. I come from Glastonbury in England, uh, which is a center for the weird and the wonderful, you know, and, and it's kind of new age stuff, and, and, and we have conferences on mysteries. We have conferences on the mysteries of the corn circles, the mysteries of the spaceships, the mysteries of the crystals. Oh. And they're all mysterious and they're all interesting. But personally, you know, I can't get over the mystery of waking up in the morning. <laughs> what is this? What is this? What is it? we are experiencing right now. What is this? That's where the Gnosis starts. Because if you come into the mystery, if you come into how profoundly mysterious this is, and realize, oh my God, most of the time we are so unconscious. We're so sucked into the story we're telling. We're so sucked into the life dream. We're that unconscious that we don't even notice the most obvious thing about our predicament. We don't notice nobody knows what's going on. Because <laughs> nobody does. If we are that unconscious, what else haven't we noticed? 
Well, I want to suggest that what we haven't noticed is that we have two natures. We're so sucked in, I'm so sucked into the story of Tim and, and what I appear to be, just like in a dream at night, that I don't notice that I am not just an object. I am also a subject. I'm not just an it, I'm also an I. And when I investigate that subjectivity, I find that's what I really know. And you see, see all these things I've said about Jesus and David and all that stuff and Muhammad, that's all opinion. I don't know that. How could I know that? I mean, it's my opinion, I've researched it, I think it's valuable, I think it's worth considering. But it's only opinion. I couldn't even tell you accurately what happened yesterday. No, none of us could let alone all that time ago. It's opinion. Where's the gnosis? Where's the knowledge? What do I know? Well, when I come into the mystery, I find, aha, I don't know much, actually. But one thing I do know is I exist right now. And I think you know that. You exist right now, and I, you don't need evidence, and you don't need footnotes, and you don't need... Da -da. You know that. It's self-evidently true, and you know it because, like me, you are witnessing this flow of ever-changing appearances, these colored shapes and sounds and thoughts, and you are witnessing this moment right now. If you come into the mystery of that moment, what I see is that I have these two natures. I'm an I and an it. There's what I appear to be, and then there's what I know myself to be. And what I know myself to be is what is witnessing all of this. There's a lovely line in the Gospel of Thomas, which is a, a Gnostic Gospel, in which these words are put into Jesus' mouth. He says, I will reveal to you what you can't see, what you can't hear, what you can't touch, and what cannot be conceived by the mind. And that's the Gnosis. What is it that you can't see, touch, hear, or imagine? It's awareness. It's what's doing the seeing, the hearing, the touching, the imagining. The revelation of the, of the Gnosis is you're not a thing. You're a nothing. You are what is witnessing all of this. You are the I witnessing this unfolding story of the person you appear to be. What you are is something changeless, witnessing this ever-changing moment. And I think each of us knows that, which is why talk to, well, I've never met anyone yet, especially as you get older, who ha doesn't feel that the real them, the real identity, who they really are, is exactly the same now as it was when they were 18. What is it that doesn't change? See, this has changed, hasn't it? But this changed completely. When Tim was 18, he had an afro. <laughs> All of this has changed, change, 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 change. What hasn't changed? The eye, the awareness, witnessing the whole thing hasn't changed. That stays the same. That's what witnesses all the changes. And if you see that and start investigating what that I is, if you put your consciousness back on itself, the world turns inside out. Because you see that what you are is a spacious emptiness, a presence which contains everything. Everything you are conscious of in this moment exists within you as awareness. My voice exists within awareness. If it didn't, you wouldn't be aware of it. Your body exists within awareness. If you didn't, you wouldn't be aware of it. This room, the lights, the breeze, the thoughts in your mind, everything exists within awareness. And that's where you hear the Gnostics saying, look, the world exists in you, just like a dream exists in you. And just like in a dream, you appear to be a certain person. But all of it is within you. And that's when you can understand when they say, look, and you exist outside time. Because time exists in you. Because time is the name we give to this flow of appearances which is 
happening inside awareness. And you start to see the paradox of our predicament. That our nature is, is on the one hand, absolutely, it's, uh, you know, here it's, I'm Tim, in the world. That's what I appear to be. But the I, what I am, is this emptiness which contains the world. Tim is in time, he's getting older, one day he'll die. But what I am is this emptiness of awareness within which the whole dream of time is arising. And finally you can see also this beautiful, big Gnostic idea, which is here, in the life dream, we're all separate. And each of us is a unique perspective on time and space, absolutely particular. None of us are the same. But this I, what we are, is one of us. There is nothing to distinguish us. There are no qualities it has which make you, you, and me, me. And this is the Gnostic vision that we are one awareness dreaming itself to be everyone and everything and experiencing itself from every conceivable perspective. And here we are meeting ourself in different forms. And that one awareness is what the original Christians, like Paul, called the Christ. And when you recognize that's what you are, you see why he said, we are the bodies of the Christ. Because we are what the Christ is dreaming itself to be. But when we identify with what we seem to be, we're kind of metaphorically dead. But if we wake up to what we are, the Christ, which is the whole purpose of the story, we come back to life, we resurrect, we awaken and discover that's our nature. It's what the Christians call the Christ. It's what the Buddhists call the Buddha nature. It's what the Hindus call the Atman. And it's what every one of us calls I. You see, we all call ourselves by the same name. I. And we write it like a one, which is kind of cute. Because there's one of it. When we look out into the dream, we all seem separate. When we turn back on what we are, we can recognize that we're all one. And why that is so... When we do that, it changes everything. Because although the dream stays the same, you recognize that you're one with everything. And when you know that you're one with all, you find yourself in love with all. Because love is how oneness feels. I have a little girl. She's five years old, and the thin veneer of separateness between us is transparent. I love her. Her joys are my joys, her suffering is my suffering, her dreams are my dreams. We are part of each other. That's what love is, it's recognizing that oneness, and we all do that. But most of us, stop that at some point. We may extend to our family, our friends, maybe even our tribe, who knows where it ends. But sooner or later, our sense of self stops and then there's the other. And when our sense of self stops, the loving stops. What happens if our sense of self expands to embrace everything? because we recognize that just like in a dream at night, we appear to be separate in a dream, but really we're the awareness within which the whole dream is arising and that we are everything in the dream and that that's true right now. When we live lucidly, there's the experience of what I call big love, very big love, because there's no limit to our compassion. And then it all looks very different. And you see that what we do to ourselves, the suffering that we cause each other and ourselves, originates from this mistaken, from one mistaken idea. That we're separate, and in reality, we are not. But we only recognize that when we wake up to what we are. When we do that, then 
it becomes a natural expression to live from that love, to find, to find the solutions we need to the suffering caused by the illusion of separateness. So this lucid living, this waking up, is the opposite of all of this divisiveness, whether it's religious divisiveness or political, or any form of divisiveness, all of which arises from an us versus them world of separateness. And it's about understanding the paradox of our predicament. Here, we're all separate within the dream. We're, we're things, we're appearances, we're, we're people. But if we wake up to the I, what we are, we're the awareness out of time within which everything's arising. And that's an experience of love. Our cultural ancestors, the original Christians, the Gnostic Christians, the people who created the Jesus myth, symbolized that state of lucid living or gnosis with the figure of the laughing Jesus. And I'm just going to end just saying a tiny little bit about the laughing Jesus. Most of us, you know, I, I have never seen a picture of Jesus laughing. What I got brought up on was, was this guy, you know, the, ah, the Mel Gibson Jesus. <laughs> All of that. The blood and guts Jesus. For the most of Christians who created the myth, that represented us lost in separateness. That represented the suffering and pain of when we are lost in the, in the dream only. But, but they also had another figure at the same time, which is the laughing Jesus, who is a being of light. He's awareness. And whilst Jesus is suffering on the cross, the real Jesus in the Gnostic texts is laughing and loving. And he says, I seem to suffer but I do not suffer because I distinguish the man from what I am, what I appear to be from what I am. And he is conscious of both being the Christ and being a separate individual. Therefore, even in the face of this most horrendous, of being tortured to death, having been betrayed by his friends, I mean, they created the, oh, the worst scenario. Even then, he is this being who is loving, and laughing because he sees that it is all a dream. Not, an, not, not, a, not because that's not valuable, not that it's not beautiful, not that it's not a great adventure to end in, enter into, but just that it's deeper and more mysterious than we think when we're lost in the illusion of separateness. And our purpose in writing The Laughing Jesus and mine in writing the little book Lucid Living is the hope that if we can find the ways of saying this to each other, we can walk each other home. We can wake each other up. And if we do, if we come into that state of oneness and love, I feel that we can turn this dream from a nightmare of separateness into the joyous celebration of existence that each one of us really, really wants it to be. Thank you very much for your kind attention.